Hi, Dan Kahn here. I know Zoom is having trouble today. Uh, I was able to get in fine, as were, by definition, all of you. Uh, but hopefully we'll get enough people here that still have the meeting be worthwhile. And as usual, we're going to wait two more minutes and start five after the hours. Okay, well, let me go ahead and kick things off. This is the first meeting of the year of the reference architecture uh, group. We are um, largely chatting about the landscape, but other related kind of topics as well. Unfortunately, it looks like Ken um, has not been able to join yet. For the agenda, we have uh, Mamet is from Verizon is going to tell us a little bit about uh, some of their architecture work. Um, but just before that, I did want to give the overview about where the, the cloud native landscape stands. And um, I want to introduce, um, oh no, looks like he dropped off. Oh no, there he is, Andre uh, to, the, uh, to the group. Andre is our uh, developer contractor um, in Spain, uh, former until a month or two ago in, in Russia who um, has done the vast majority of all the coding for the interactive landscape. And so if you find the tool useful or have ideas on how to make it better or such, he's um, the one to thank and the one to make suggestions to. Uh, he and I have both been pretty busy over the last, over the holidays and the last month in uh, refactoring the application to be an upstream NPM module. And I had, um, included links to this in the email, but we're pretty pleased now that the app itself um, lives here, and then CNCF is one downstream of it, but the um, Linux Foundation Deep Learning is another. And our hope is that over the year, a bunch of other Linux Foundation projects and potentially other projects will uh, make use of the code and wind up doing their own downstream versions. And uh, as with everything from CNCF, it's all licensed Apache 2.0. And so any of you are also welcome to make use of the code and create your own versions or uh, your own ideas for uh, for landscapes and such. Um, I don't know that there's a lot of other updates that we have. I mean, you're, you're very welcome to subscribe to uh, the feed of commit changes and you can see every single change that's made. We are making several different changes per week as projects come in or companies um, go under or uh, projects disappear or stop getting committed to. And so th there's been a pretty nice pace of, of changes and updates. Uh, the one other comment that I would just maybe bring up to this group for a second is um, uh, someone, I forget who opened the issue, uh, mentioned that the application definition and image build section has a lot of very different stuff in it. And um, I thoroughly agree with that. And it, it does remind me a little bit of what previously was the service management section, which we then were able to successfully pry apart into the remote procedure call, service proxy, API gateway, and service mesh. Um, but when I look at this uh, application definition and image build, it's not instantly clear to me which of these are which and then splitting it trying to come up with two 
sub things, and they don't have to be exactly those two, uh, how we would go about uh, doing that. So um, let me maybe call on uh, Lee for a second or uh, Randy, where I'm curious if either of you two have a view on that section in particular and an idea on how we might uh, clean it out, clean it up a little bit or, or segment it out. Uh, yeah, hey Dan, this is Lee. The uh, yeah, Lee, I, a little louder, please. Oh, yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Hey, hey Dan, hey. As I look at the landscape and I filter on app definition and development. Oh, okay. Yeah, now I now I see. So I high level filtered and and, and the uh, the three projects that came back were Vitesse, Nats, and Helm. And uh, yeah, it's it's maybe Vitesse that it's maybe the database portion of this that that. Just to feel a bit forced, uh, which is I think is what you're already identifying. Then, I mean, hey, what, you know, is there is there a pre-existing bucket that it maybe more appropriately fits into? Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Right now, platform is for the most part relegated to. Kubernetes, is that right? We we are uh, the the very final section is the non Kubernetes. Oh, okay. The PaaS container service. Gotcha. Think about that. And so, unless I'm you know misthinking, mischaracterizing Vitesse. Well, yeah. And so there's some stateful concerns there with Vitesse. The Rook is certainly. Lee, Lee I, I'm still having trouble hearing you, but I, I'm not quite sure what you're looking at. Are you looking at the same over the cloud native landscape? Because if it tests is at the very top left under database, and then platform is over on the right middle. There, there we go. I, uh, um, hopefully, maybe the microphone. Oh, yeah. So, so wait, wait. So let me stop you for a second. So, uh, can you click the landscape button? Great. Now, right in the top middle, application definition and image bundle and image build was the area that I wanted to ask you about. And you might go to the top right and increase the size a little bit, a little lower. There's a, nope, oh, gotcha. yeah, there. Uh, okay. So see, we've now made the form, the static landscape totally interactive here. So yeah. it's, it's and, and if, if you wanna dive in, you can then click the header that says application definition image build, yeah. And that'll show you that there are uh, 21 projects in this space. And I mean, there's a lot of, variety between Helm and Packer yeah. and Telpresence and Open Service Broker API and Open API Initiative. I mean, Open API. So I, I, I'm definitely not trying to, so my, my concern here is, oh, these are kind of a lot of different things. Um, but the, oh, are there two subcategories that we could easily split them into hasn't been clear to me yet. Yeah. Yes, uh, yeah, between Habitat, well, Cubevert, Minikube, uh, yeah, they, they, yeah, yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah, because um, yeah, some of these are just, some of these are just definitions, and then some of these are, like ha Habitat in, in particular uses, is its own, uh, I don't know if you'd say run, you, you wouldn't necessarily say runtime, but it, it, it is a day two, it is an ongoing. Um, and Kubevert is being a, really an API spec. So, uh, Dan, let me, uh, let me digest the, that, that I, I'm not offering. Oh, it's that. fine. Yeah, I, I wasn't, I, I didn't mean to put you on the spot too much. And Randy, do you have any, anything you might add? Yeah, I'm, I'm sort of in a similar position where just kind of digesting this a little bit and looking through it, but um, th there's a there is a little bit of a 
kind of a crossover between for, for me, like when I look at um, some of these things, um, you know, it, it gets into the, some of the stuff, some of the stuff sort of has a, a little bit of a crossover with configuration management. So, you know, you uh -huh. got Habitat in there, you got kind of Boschy kind of a flavor to some of those things. And, you know, I, 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 I wouldn't like at, at first blush, I wouldn't have any obvious like, Oh, that, that just shouldn't be there or this is a, a, a bad structure. So I don't think there's any, you know, critical flaw. Could, is there a better way to organize stuff? maybe but i think you know kind of like incremental refinement um you know is where we're at here at this point because that that category is pretty broad right application definition and image build yeah makes it even broader yeah okay so i i, I would sort of say the mailing list is open it, would anyone else like to comment or uh, make a suggestion here well, as the person who got, this is uh, Ducey. Uh, so as the person who got Habitat on this, uh, back when I worked at Chef, the challenge that we had was, yes, it does more than just application definition. And so there is a lot of day two components, but we ran into the blocker of, we need to be in one box. So, I mean, it, I think that's just the thing that we're gonna continue to suffer with on the landscape. Um. Every every project is a, is a beautiful snowflake, Michael. That <laughs> right <laughs> uh, deserves its very own category to fully appreciate its its unique yes. aspects. Yes, exactly. But I, I do think it's helpful to think of the of the categories or the subcategories as being the least bad place to yes. describe what it yep. does. Yep. Um, my only my perspective is when you look within a category and say how far apart are the different things here in this subcategory, I feel like that subcategory maybe has the biggest range of stuff in there. Yeah. But I think to your point, um, like having this NPM module gives us the capability to go back and there's no reason why we couldn't blow up application definition and image build into subcategories and then talk about which one each one does um, what, what each tool does within that broader scope, right? Yep. Like, so if you could drill down into application definition and image build, and then inside of that, you have sub subcategories, right? That could be something that's useful. Yeah, I, I'm open to that. Uh, it looks like Ken just joined. Uh, Ken, we were just, before we uh, went over to Mamet, we were just talking about application and definition image build is maybe being the widest category or, or most expansive category that we have on here right now. Um, and uh, Lee, since you're looking around, would you mind just popping up the uh, LFDL link that I shared a minute ago in the chat window, landscape.lfdl.io? You bet. It's in the chat window if you want to. Or I, I don't know, is that, yeah, there, uh, there you go. And so this is just um, uh, obviously a totally different space and we don't need to spend any time on it. And I'm not going to try and defend the exact category choices and such. But I do think it's pretty cool that the uh, all the underlying code was able to be, is continually able to be used between it. And, and literally the only difference on this um, downstream project, you can click on any of the boxes there is that it um, uh, has a different YAML file for the landscape and uh, different images loaded in. But otherwise, everything works exactly the same way. Um, and they're also very ha open to feedback if folks have ideas that they'd like to see or different uh, suggestions on how it should work. And I do. Um, okay. Go ahead. And this is Randy. I, I did have one area that in the landscape that has been in the back of my mind that I thought maybe would be interesting to discuss, but I don't want to mess with your agenda. So why don't you go ahead? Uh, we'll see how if we can just rewrite the whole thing in the next three or four minutes, but then we can <laughs> get to me. So, so I, I'm, I'm navigated there, but if you want to just go back to the overall landscape. It's the different 
tab, uh, Lee, yeah. There we go. So, um, yeah, so one of the things that you see here in um, orchestration and management in that layer is you've got, um, you've got the RPC stuff down there. And to me, that is really um, an application development component, right? If I'm designing a distributed application, I might um, decide to use gRPC or Apache Thrift. Um, I would, you know, I would say that to me, like I, those those kinds of decisions, those sorts of architectural decisions are going to be the same ones I'm going to make as to like, I'm going to use NATS or I'm going to use, um, you know, uh, RabbitMQ or something like that, or I'm going to use a Kafka. Um, these are, these are communications uh, schemes for your microservices. And while you know, I like the bucket RPC, I think that's a really important bucket and people um, should recognize that bu bucket. It's very, to me, parallel to the type of use case and decision process and kind of componentry that you would have for messaging. The two, the two ways that you know, you, you're gonna have your microservices interacting are going to be you know, request response style like REST and RPC and then you know, more async messaging types of solutions which um, you know, are, are different in kind because most of the messaging systems don't involve, you know, the client talking directly to the server. There's some platform components. So you have, you know, your Kafka brokers or your NATS brokers or what have you. But in an RPC scenario, you know, they're talking directly, but you're, it's more the technology that you're selecting for that interoperability and the, you know, the library and IDL generation stuff. So that's one thought. And then inside the RPC, I would, I, I don't know if there's anybody who's promoting Avro as an RPC solution. If there is, uh, would love to chat more with them about that. But um, being an RPC buff a bit, um, every time I've looked at Avro as a realistic way to do RPC, I have found it to not, that's not its shtick, in other words. I, I, you know, Avro is great for serializing data to, to disk where you want to have the schema embedded with the data so that you can you know, retrieve it many years later without having to remember what the old schema was. It's, it's uh, really awesome for that. But that approach hasn't worked out well for RPC. And a lot of times the RPC stuff that they show on their website doesn't actually even work. Um, it's not maintained from what I can tell. Um, so I, I would say that pointing someone at Avro for RPC is almost, uh, you know, a discourteous. <laughs> um, maybe maybe I'm wrong, but this is the last time I looked at it about a year ago um, with some uh, with some care. And then the other thing that I think is a really useful tool that's not mentioned in that bucket, though it doesn't fit in there exactly, is, is protocol buffers. I, and I'm not sure exactly where on the landscape it is. I'm sure it's on there somewhere, but it is a serialization. No, scheme. it's not. It's not? Uh, I mean, just, just we, no, we don't have protocol buffs on here, uh, obviously they're a dependency of gRPC, um, but the the argument has been that they're more operating at a different layer and, and not, not necessarily a layer that we're, that we're covering. And it's true, but Avro itself really is a serialization scheme. Like, so it's a, it's a lot more akin to protocol buffers. Um, and I think also that protocol buffers is used by a lot of people before gRPC ever existed as a, as really as a, as an R, people built RPC schemes on protocol buffers without gRPC. So while. Well, well, yeah, and, and you still can. Yeah. I mean, the, my, my issue on it is just, uh, we pasted in where Avro does claim to be an RPC, but to be, uh, to not, to, to also offer RPC. Uh, I, I totally believe you that they don't do a good job at it or that it's not well maintained or such, but it, it's just, it is right there that they're not just rich data structures and a compact fast binary format, but they also are a remote procedure call. So yeah. in that sense, they claim to be while um, protobufs uh, has never claimed to be an RPC mechanism. Um, sure. Although, you know, if you look at the protobuf website before gRPC, they, they were all sorts of pointers to how you could quickly do RPC with it. And I, I guess, you know, if you want, if, 
I, I would be interesting to get some feedback from people from the uh, Avro project if if they really felt like it was a good idea to offer Avro out as an RPC solution because I really really I, 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 yeah and I don't don't think anybody's actually if you wanted to do a um an, an email exchange with folks there I, I I mean I'm very happy to remove them um the and other I, I feel like you know if we added it would be okay to have them in there yeah. then you're then you're kind of you know, addressing the fact that they are great for serialization. And if you wanted to build your own RPC scheme or try to make the one that they show work, um, you could. Um, and then protobuf would be kind of a lot more of a, a you know, a sent, you know, related kind of a project, but if it feels like we should have protobuf yeah. in there somewhere. I don't know. I mean, we could rename this category to be serialization and remote procedure call. That might and be then great. put protobufs in. My, my my slight concern is, oh, then do we need to put in another 25 things as well? It's true. Um, I mean, we're but, not going to uh, put JSON in. Yeah, I mean, Thrift Flat has buffers, integrated serialization. Message pack. It, Thrift has integrated serialization. Avro has integrated serialization. GRPC has an almost explicit I mean, protobuf yeah. dependency. But in that sense, gRPC has explicit serialization. Right, though they do suggest that you don't have to use proto protobuf if you don't want to. I, I, I'm happy to come back to it. I mean, I, yeah. So, but you know, I, the, the I, thing, I know it is. The bigger thing yeah. to me would be moving it up a layer, right? I feel like it really strongly belongs next to like streaming messaging and that sort of stuff rather than in orchestration. And I, yeah, I, I mean, I think the reason it's here is more the management than the orchestration. And then just the belief that the RPC is often a building block for streaming and messaging, even though it can be a direct competitor to it. But um, I, I'm curious if anybody else wants to voice an opinion on, on the topic. Uh, I mean, I, I don't disagree with you, though, that RPC can and is also used for app definition and, and development. I mean, it, that's it just principally like what it's for. It has an ex I, <clears throat> I do think that even with respect to the RPC discussion we're having and back with respect to the application definition and image build, that it is, it, when I was trying to provide thoughtful feedback earlier, I was not taking into context the fact that there was that that this particular collection was also in context of being the highest layer in a series of layers. And so uh, it's a good reminder to reflect on that, like uh, the, the notion that like, or part of what Dan just said that, that resonates with me a bit is, yeah, is the notion of the, these layerings, is the notion of, you know, hardware, you know, Potentially hardware things, potentially here or even just the, the notion that some of these get layered layered on, and so it's good to take into context. Yeah, and I think about it like this: if I build an application, and I and I have uh, an architecture where there are five microservices, and two of them are going to talk to each other through async message streaming over NATs, and the other guys are going to talk to each other and through, through the head end of that system through RPC. I will have to pick an RPC solution that I will actually use in my application. But by building that into my Go or JavaScript or whatever it is application that I build, it makes me absolutely, completely, you know, it has no dependency on the underlying orchestration and development platform. I could run that same app on Docker Swarm with Compose or in Mesos or on Kubernetes or on bare metal. And yet, it's using RPC. It's a it's an application development tool. If I'm if my application that I'm developing is Kubernetes, and I happen to choose gRPC, that that's fine. But now you're 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 sort of shifting your you know it's an orthogonal vector, right? Where you're saying my app is the orchestration platform. So I get it. gRPC is important to people who build distributed application platforms because those are essentially microservice applications too. But it's an app development tool. You know, it's not, it's not a, a platform orchestration thing. And, and while, yeah, you should be able to instrument all calls between multiple applications, I should be able to see 
message is flowing from app A to app B over NATS. I should just as equally easily be able to see messages flowing over gRPC or Thrift between app A and app B. Um, that's, you know, that, obs that observability is a cross-cutting concern, and that's why it's in the tower on the right. Um, so that, 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 that's how this stuff comes to me, right? If I'm an app developer and I don't care about the platform, I'm going to consider my RPC solution. It's going to be an important part of my decision-making process. And it's going to be one that, that I make very carefully because unlike uh, the innards of my microservice that I can turn over 50 times without affecting anybody else, we're talking about the contract between systems in my, or between microservices in my application, which is the same kind of contract you get when you commit to Kafka or Nats or Vitesse or something like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Management. Uh, hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting to reflect also on the uh, the constituency of the other groups within the orchestration and management layer and how infrastructurally those feel as versus randy i think the thing you're, you're sort of highlighting as being a bit more of a a developer-centric concern you know maybe another way of characterizing things and looking at it through a different lens is you know who, who's the core persona that is maybe has a higher degree of concern for that layer that may help to reflect on. So Randy, you're saying, hey, you know, th th this is pretty developer-centric? For those, those Absolutely developer-centric, yeah. yeah. And then, you know, potentially not necessarily the same for the majority of the rest of the constituency of these projects? Yeah, and, and the, one of the great things about um, Service Mesh, you know, projects like Envoy and what have you, is they let you monitor all of the traffic between all of these systems that's their job and the observability projects like um, you know open tracing those guys are the plugins it, it, it just really speaks to the point that operators don't want to have to care about what the developers have chosen to use right it, you could be using the mysql protocol but on the back end it could be the test it could be actually mysql it could be you know maria db or any number of other aurora something else um, but the 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 hooks that let you view this stuff um, you know they need to know about those things but clearly mysql is an application developer level construct it's not it's not like those things are independent and should be completely firewalled off though the more they are, the nicer it is for the operators. And that's what, you know, tools like Envoy bring to the table. Envoy, yes, does let you, you know, get some extra juice from a gRPC um, interaction than it would over something else. But that sort of just goes back to the protocol. Um, HTTP, you know, being mined for, for data. You can do the same thing with, with other schemes, of course, if you have, you know, if, if you have the, the, the protobuf specs for your, you know, exchanges that are protobuf based, even if they're messaging oriented, um, you know, your, your instrumentation can decompose those and grab stuff out of them. So, you know, there, there's never going to be complete independence, but when it comes to the, 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 the development process and the kinds of things you need, you, you need to pick an RPC solution. You don't want to build one from scratch. So, um, you need to pick a messaging solution. You need to pick a you know storage solution, and all of those things kind of are up in that higher le level. And if I'm building a platform, I don't pick gRPC. I use gRPC because Kubernetes is using it, and Docker and Containerd are using it. Not not because I picked it, but because some developer picked it up at that higher level. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, <laughs> Is Ken available to come off mute? It's star six normally to, to get off mute, Ken.
Yeah, and guys, so, um, I, I want to also want to throw in there that that this landscape is so awesome. I don't, you know, this is like really nitpicking. So, I, oh I'm no, no, I, I, I'm yeah, yeah, happy with it, it, the way it, it is. Yeah, it, it's only, but it's only good because people are working to improve it. I, I mean, the, the fundamental thing here is that RPC is a different category than streaming messaging. I, I don't know, think that's always true, and, and I do think gRPC is very much used as a streaming solution at times and 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 some, some sometimes NAS and gRPC are directly competitive with each other um, so I, I do see the argument for that being up on the application layer I also do see it as as being a core piece of infrastructure that interacts with kubernetes and and envoy and Prometheus and a lot of other projects so I I, I can see the argument both ways here um, but I, well, I think we should Dan, put a hold just, on like, it yeah. I can draw a parallel there in that uh, in the open stack world RabbitMQ, at least for a while, was the way that all of the services talked to each other. So mm -hmm. that would be, you'd have to put streaming and messaging down in the platform layer. I guess the main thing to me is that there are some fundamental things that you do when you're building a microservice solution. And one of those fundamental things is you pick an async messaging solution. And the other one is you pick a, a, a you know, request response scheme, which might be REST, or gRPC or a combination or something like that. But those are so parallel. And to your point, you can implement messaging on RPC and you can implement RPC on messaging. Uh, you know, yeah. you can equally make RPC requests over NATS if you want to. So they're, they're similar, but, but they have some, you know, if you're gonna do messaging, you, you sort of take certain fundamental decisions and, and go that route. And then you 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 um, you can do the RPC stuff, but you're a little less efficient at it, or it's a little bit more work for the developers. And then flip flop for the other side, but they're you know fundamentally targetedly different technologies and different schemes for interaction, but they they operate I think really clearly to me at the same level. Okay, could we um, put a hold on this for now? I, I am happy to revisit it by email or or in a call next month and go ahead and hand it over to Mamet because I think he had some uh, some architecture work he was going to uh, present. Sure. Sure. Um, let me... and, and another perfectly valid argument for leaving it the way it is, is there's a lot of icons in the messaging one and the top layer has boxes with lots of icons in it. Uh, we are a little bit running out of space, but um, you know, one of the advantages of it being open source is that you could go ahead and lay out your own version of it and, and show it as it actually fits better that way. Uh, Dan, should I start? Yeah, could you please? Sure. Uh, first of all, uh, my name is Mehmet Toy. I'm with Verizon, and I'm really the, very new to the group. And uh, the first thing before I start this, uh, is there a document or is there a link that you can send me about the, the current status of the, or where is the architecture that you are working with and what's the architecture you're working with and also the status of the development? That will help me quite a bit. Uh, so far, Eli, I haven't gotten much information about the group. So, uh, what I am going to present is certainly very high level, uh, but you're going to see the connection to the to the containers and what I am as a service provider. What I am really looking for at this point. So. Uh, for that is, I need to give you the cloud service architecture concept, describe that, and then tie that to the containers. Uh, cloud service architectures has been work in the Metro Ethernet forum. And the first draft was out uh, a couple of months ago. And I'm hoping that the, this will be standardized uh, in the first half of this year. So um, cloud service, uh, as you can see, uh, we come up with a de description, but uh, it's very difficult actually to describe it. But nevertheless, the uh, cloud service really uh, contains connectivity, uh, first of all, applications, and the connectivity to the applications. So 
for example, if you look at the uh, NIST definitions, let's say software as a service or the platform as a service and things like that, uh, you're going to see really only the inclusion of the applications. It does really does not include the connectivity to the applications. And there is definitely good reasons for that because, you know, initially uh, the cloud uh, stuff started with the uh, public cloud and public cloud people uh, access via uh, internet. So therefore really uh, they're probably uh, much, uh, people didn't want to talk about the connectivity or the networking really access to the, uh, to the applications. However, uh, now as you will see the organizations like AT&T and Verizon, uh, we do offer the cloud applications. So the life has changed. We have the connectivity and the, and the applications, but also really everything else around it, which is the management and so on and so forth. So therefore, uh, the, all of them really uh, constitute a cloud service. And cloud service will have, most of will have, non-virtualized component as well as virtualized component. So if I look at the applications, probably most of the applications are, are virtualized or software, written in software, but in the networking, uh, you will have non-virtualized component on top of it. So um, I basically put all of them like in one uh, chart to show how they can be related to each other. Of course, this is not the one way to do it, uh, but may, mostly at the bottom, you will have a network as a service, and then you build on top of that infrastructure, platform, software, communications, security, and maybe others. And uh, as you can see, either you can build on top of each other, or maybe you can skip uh, for example, you can have a platform as a service on top of the NAS. Now, that doesn't mean you're not going to have the infrastructure components. You will have it, but that may not be offered as a separate service. So, um, if you look at the characteristics, uh, characteristics is uh, those uh, virtualized and non-virtualized components, as I mentioned, and it could be networks, applications, and also the connections connections, as you will see, uh, between a service subscriber and the application or between the subscribers. And also the components like VNFs and the PNFs can be provided by one operator or multiple operators, again, as you will see later uh, in the diagrams. And uh, the other uh, maybe key characteristics is the elasticity. Elasticity in terms of the on-demand service configuration, even self-configurations by the subscribers, and also the collaboration. And scalability, as you know, scale in and out, that is one of the common uh, features that is being expected. And also service level specifications. So there are some quality of service associated with it, uh, with the end-to-end uh, -end service, and maybe other parameters and things like that. Uh, so there are quality service parameters with the, with the service. And also the usage-based billing, and that is the, um, it really depends on uh, how the service provider is capable of uh, supporting that. In other words, uh, you can see maybe hourly, maybe by minutes, maybe even less than that. So depending on the really capability, uh, they will have the usage-based billing. So, um, just when I give you a couple examples, this is one of the common examples that you have a customer uh, or subscriber using the public internet and accessing to the uh, public cloud providers such as Amazon, Google, and things like that. And there is also the private networks. Uh, the customers or subscribers do use the private networks, uh, like Verizon. You use the Verizon private networks to get to the public cloud providers such as Amazon. And also the combinations. They may use the private networks, but also as a backup, they may use the public network. There is also another uh, variation over here. That is the, uh, the subscriber may go through the private network and they access to the private cloud providers applications such as Verizon. And that private cloud provider may have actually a communications or connectivity to the public cloud provider such as uh, Amazon. And the end user or the subscriber thinks actually they are you know, using the Amazon's app, the applications on the Verizon, but they may actually use the applications on Amazon. So 
uh, with this, uh, the communication between the private cloud provider and public cloud provider are important. And this is another place that we're trying to send it. Uh, by the way, uh, this work has been uh, presented to Amazon and a couple of years back presented to uh, Microsoft and others by myself and Equinix. So uh, there's also the uh, subscriber who would like to, whether they go, they use public internet or the private networks, but either way, they do want to have an access to the multiple uh, public cloud providers from the same networks. And one more is the Cloud Exchange Gateway. This is the, uh, they would like to have a gateway that can cloud carriers, cloud carriers such as uh, Verizon could be counted as a cloud carrier or AT&T is a cloud carrier. They can talk to each other or cloud providers can talk to each other such as Amazon and Microsoft. And so um, this is actually another uh, pretty much desired capability that uh, I heard from Amazon and anybody else uh, to see, have a, to have a cloud exchange gateway and using hopefully this architecture. So, uh, the two more examples, and the, one of them is the cloud in a box, and that is really uh, a, it's a customer premises equipment which is providing the virtualization infrastructure, and on top of that, it may or may not provide the applications. So it's connected to the cloud service uh, provider, as you can see, which has the cloud carrier and also the cloud provider. So in this case, for example, the uh, subscriber at the customer premises do use the infrastructure provided by the cloud provider in addition to what it, what it has on the uh, customer premises. And this is UCPE, universal CPE, or the virtual CPE is the best example. Uh, in another version is the, uh, even though a subscriber or the customer will have a application, uh, in the UCP, for example, they may actually establish a service chain between the application that they have and the applications offered by the cloud provider. And another simple example is, of course, the uh, subscriber will come a very simple uh, device and basically connected to the cloud carrier, and then from there, uh, maybe a simple browser access to the various cloud applications. So uh, with that, uh, let me describe this one and then I'll stop if you have any questions so far and then I'll continue the rest. So uh, this is the, uh, describe, this diagram describes the cloud service actors and on the left side you see cloud service subscriber and on the right side is the cloud service provider. Cloud service provider is the one responsible from everything really for the service. So from the provisioning to the uh, maintenance and plus the billing and single point of contact to the cloud service subscriber. That uh, cloud service provider may or may not own the cloud carrier facilities and the um, cloud providers facilities, or uh, you know, it may own maybe the just cloud carrier portion of it and so on and so forth. But in summary, you need to have a cloud carrier for the connectivity and also you need the cloud provider to support the applications. Now, you know, as we had like uh, 10 minutes ago, we were talking about applications. So I'll try to give you a little bit insight to what we meant by the applications and how that really maps to what you're saying there to what we have discussed a couple minutes ago. So, uh, so if you, so now I'm gonna go into the cloud service architectures in more detail. If you have any questions, please stop me. Um, First of all, the intent was why we came up with this thing was really uh, to simplify the uh, the cloud services in such a way that the, we, as a service provider, we can manage it, and also we can hide the complexities uh, from the subscriber. That was the main intention, and of course, on top of that is can we use the tools that we already have? Now that doesn't mean we are not going to change it. We will change it, but at least we may end up with the minimal changes if we have an architecture that can at least resemble to what we have been using so far. So um, 
The key objectives are, as I said, hiding the implementation and also, of course, to allow subscribers to have self configurations and also use the LSO architecture. What is this? This is actually LSO means lifecycle service orchestration. And this architecture uh, came out of the MEF and mainly is trying to define these management interfaces internally and as well as management interfaces between the operators. And for example, um, uh, two, two interfaces are defined between the operators. Are, one of them is called the Sonata for real service ordering. And the other one is called the interlude uh, to uh, define the service provisioning or the whatever the configuration needs to happen between the operators. Uh, so that interface between the op the orchestrators, between the interfaces of two operators is called the interlude. So, and of course, on top of that is the service O&M. Service O&M is really health check, uh, periodically self check, and also maybe the loopback and those kind of things. Can we also use those if we have an architecture again, somewhat similar to what we have been using so far for other services? So with that, uh, if you look at the, by the way, I don't know, if I'm hoping that my slides are visible. So maybe. Uh, oh, so, we can see them. We're, 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 oh. we're, we're looking at them. I, I just, you, you do have 10 minutes left, so I, I, I'm a little unclear. Uh, oh, okay. The, if I have the 10 minutes, then I have to speed up here. so that I get to the containers. Okay, that'd be great. So um, this is the user interface to the cloud service provider, and there is a standard interface between them, which we define. And the interface is, as you can see, broken into two, two levels. One is called the application interface, and the other one is called the connectivity interface. So in this case, the subscriber is only using the connectivity. So, and, but in this case, subscribers do have the application interface as well as the connectivity. And, and this is the protocol stack, and protocol stack is the, we call the cloud connectivity uni and cloud application uni. Cloud connectivity uni is from layer one up to layer three, and the application uni is from layer two up to layer seven. Uh, and the cloud application interfaces could be a VM interface, as you have seen, as you can see on this diagram. And, or it could be, a uh, interface to uh, a virtual NIC. And even further, more than that, it could be an interface to a virtual network function, whether it's been supported by the container, whether it's been supported by the virtual machine. And I wanna go one step further, and we're thinking that if we use that cloud application interface to represent the con container interface. So, uh, of course, the, there will be some differences in the attributes, but nevertheless, generically, we would like to call that container interface. So now, I mean, the cloud application interface. So for us is, how do we interface to a container? How does this container talk to another VM, or how does this container talk to another container? It's very important. And again, this is what we're trying to standardize Again, not just for the containers, but all other virtual components, VNFs and things like that. But nevertheless, we need to really identify what is interface for the container. Now, there is one more interface in the contain for the interface that we are for the container that we are interested that does not show which these diagram these slides don't show. That is the interface between the container and the kernel. So that interface is also important. We need to standardize that so that we can use the, um, you know, the containerized VNFs from various vendors to be able to run on top of the, the kernel. So, um, so then the, this is basically operator interfaces and so on and so forth. It's the really same approach. Even the operator interfaces, we have defined the application interface and the connectivity interface. Again, hoping that the, uh, if we use a container interface, that will be, uh, the, that will comply with the application interface that we define uh, for these services. 
Uh, again, this is the protocol stack, which we will pretty much the same thing. And, and then comes to the connections. So connections is, if I have an end user here, and let's say I have a container over here, or a, you know application on top of the container, then as a subscriber, I establish a connection. It's called a cloud virtual connection. And this connection will have endpoints collecting the cloud virtual connection endpoint on one side, and cloud virtual connection endpoint on the other side. So if this is a container, container is supposed to support that too. And the connection can be provided by multiple operators, as you can see. And if that's the case, then you can have the segments in each operator that we treat them separately, maintain them separately, and so on. Uh, and finally, maybe this is the picture. So if I am the subscriber over here and receiving the service from cloud service operator, cloud service provider, then as you can see, I have the uh, segments for each cloud operator, and then they are terminated by endpoints, and same thing on each operator, and they form the end-to-end -end cloud virtual connections, uh, which the services basically are riding on. That's basically it. I didn't gonna wanna go to further details, but I stop and um, I wanna hear your questions. Thank you. Neil, I mean, this is Dan Kahn from Stancia. My, my initial feedback is that this is a higher level of abstraction yes. in terms of block diagrams and such yes. than we're used to operating in. Um, yes. And we, we, CNCF definitely tends to look at Kubernetes related solutions as to try, as opposed to solutions that are are kind of abstracting away to work with any possible technology. So um, th th now that's not a hard and fast rule. I mean, we, there, there's, and I guess there are plenty of counterexamples uh, to it. But um, I I'm curious if you run into the network service mesh work that's um, being led by Edward Nicky of Cisco and um, the project Legato. So I don't think I have. There is another project, it's called Legato, but that is being <laughs> the MEF. Maybe they are using the same name. So I'm not familiar with the what's going on in the Cisco under Legato name. Okay, so um, I will make an introduction on the mailing list to Ed and encourage you to get involved with that group. I, uh, the Legato I'm speaking about is on the, um, I, I'm pasting this into the Zoom chat window but it's a cloud native platform for developing pluggable service agents. But it's essentially um, a, a format for out of band signaling on in Kubernetes to um, allow a, a different kind of pod networking, more of a layer two um, pod networking for particularly higher performance um, kinds of uh, kinds of interconnects. And it's, it's um, essentially a, a way of doing carrier grade networking um, that is implemented uh, in Kubernetes as a, a custom resource definition, a CRD, and so uh, doesn't interfere with all the, the ways that networking works today. So I, I definitely would encourage you to look at their work, and I believe they're now doing weekly calls and are, are quite engaged on it. And, and I think that might be a, a good group to try and engage with. But I, m maybe you could just talk a little bit about what are the outcomes that you're looking for here? This is yes. a sort of a high level architecture diagram, yes. but is there code that's been implemented for, for uh, written for implementing any of this? So um, first of all, I appreciate for all these and I certainly get connected with Cisco team as well. Uh, what my intent was over here, I wanted to see if you are being able to define the interface to the container, is there a way for us to standardize that? That's one. Second is the, uh, so interface between the containers, interface between the, uh, from the container to a kernel, as I mentioned, and from the management perspective, we are not really tied into the Kubernetes. It could be Kubernetes, it could be something else. So I was trying to see if this team has you know, it has looked at those issues and whether we can utilize those and where we go from there. That was really my intention to coming to this team and then presenting this architecture. Okay, and just to be clear, the, the network service mesh is actually 
folks involved from Red Hat and, and Ericsson, a number of other companies as well. Uh, it's just a Cisco person that's that's taken the lead on it. But uh, definitely within CNCF to date, I, I think CNI, the container network interface, is the um, dominant way of, of networking with containers. And then network service mesh is, is designed to be an alternative to that that doesn't doesn't need to work with CNI, but I, I'm not sure that the approach that you're talking about here is, I, I guess I, I don't really understand the details of it, of how it would uh, compare to, to CNI or, or, or network service mesh. So I, I would really encourage you to go out and, and, and work with Ed in that, um, in that uh, activity for the next uh, few weeks, and then w as you kind of have, get a better lay of the land of the container world, um, to please feel free to sort of circle back, and, and maybe we could also just do an offline call to talk about some of these issues. I think that would be great. I really appreciate that. If you can, I'm sure you're going to post this thing on the chat window, and I'll take it from there. And I appreciate. What well, I'll actually do it on the mailing list just so that everybody. Oh, okay, can see cool, it. cool. Thank you. Thank you very much. And listen, I know I know Ed very well. I can be on that call with you, the introductory one. Thank you. That would be really cool. Ken, is there anything you want to add on that front? No, no, I think I don't want to be overly discouraging here. No, no, no. I think I think you were right on, Dan. I, I was thinking the same thing. So um okay. Well why don't we stop there? But the, the mailing list is available and, and we're um I do think there's a, a ton of interest and activity, maybe in, in the network service mesh work. So I would definitely encourage you to to get involved there and see if it it does fit what you're looking for. Cool, cool. I'll definitely do that. Thank you, then. Okay. Well, thanks for the call, and um, let's circle back next month and talk more about whether RPC should move up a layer. And uh, feel free to suggest anything else for that call. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, all. Thank you. Okay. Bye now. Thanks, everyone.